so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our workshop on reimagining a co-constructed partnership between student teachers, mentor teachers, and supervisors. Um, we're just excited for this opportunity to reevaluate the current structure of this partnership and to uh, brainstorm with you all on how we can transform it. And so there are six of us here today and you'll be able to hear um, different perspectives on these relationships. So we hope that uh, you'll be able to share, share your thoughts as well. Um, so we can start by introducing all the presenters. I'm Mallory Comia. I'm a recent graduate from UCI's MAT program um, where I was a student teacher in Santa Ana Unified School District. Eve, you're next. Hi, I'm Eve. I'm Eve Frisky. I am a mentor teacher at Irvine Unified School District. Hi, I'm Leanne Sines. I'm also a UCI MAT, a former UCI MAT student, and I was actually in a paired placement um, with Mallory in her second placement at Santa Ana, and I was also there for my first placement. I'm Wendy Hammett. I'm a mentor teacher in Santa Ana, California, and I got to work with Mallory and Leanne. My name is Michael Stern. I'm also a recent graduate of the UCI MAT program. We had our last day on Friday. <laughs> um, and I was working in um, as a student teacher with Eve in Eve's classroom in Irvine Unified. And I'm Evelyn Young. I'm a lecturer and a supervisor in, a, in the UCI MAT program. And I had the privilege of working with all of the folks here on the panel. I was a supervisor for um, Allery, Michael, and Leanne. And and Eve and Wendy were the mentor teachers who um, supported them in their student teaching process. Okay. So just to start off when getting this together, this whole presentation, we all talked collaboratively and we're thinking about what goals do we want as a partnership and the triad within this. And we just decided on these three goals through our discussion together, um, as well as input we actually got from student teachers within the UCI's MAT program. We came up with these goals first and then we got that feedback to see if kind of like their ideas matched ours with these goals. Um, and may, these may be some things that you have already implemented within your program, or if you have then please share with us when we go into small, smaller groups so that we can learn from each other. And these are just some key things that we noticed that we would like to change and possible ways that we could create these changes within this triad. So for the survey, after coming up with the goals, like I said before, um, we thought it would be great to just get some student voices to see if our goals really reflected of what others were feeling. So we did it within the UCI MAT program. Um, there were 35 single subject candidates and 46 multiple subject candidates. Um, the survey types was scales from one to five or short answers. And these are some of the questions that I can leave up, up to you to read that we have asked. And these are questions that you're gonna see later on as we're kind of presenting our um, different goals and the questions that we asked. And it basically reflects the same thing. So one of our goals that we mentioned, um, the first one was creating a partnership through shared positionality. And so this is ensuring that although we all have different titles and roles in this professional relationship, that our focus is to learn from each other and to support each other. And so oftentimes the role of a student teacher is just to listen and follow, be observed and scored. Um, and this cycle kind of repeats through many observations until we're told, okay, now teach your own classrooms. So we want to deconstruct this approach to the observations that reduce the student teacher to kind of a score and a comment and think about how we can use these required observations as a tool um, for constructive discussions. So on this next slide, we gathered some quotes from the student surveys that we mentioned, and we chose a few that represent um, some experiences that we share with um, others in the program. And one of them was talking about how the evaluative nature of observations in general, that first quote up there, um, along with the kind of some, a lack of support for or collaboration between student teachers and supervisors may lead to student teachers um, expressing that they, they felt they weren't able to make mistakes 
in front of their supervisors or they just felt a lot more comfortable with um, their mentor teachers in the learning process. So we'll all talk about these after. I just wanna highlight the second quote um, that talks about the odd tension between um, a mentor and supervisor where there's kind of a comparison of different teaching styles and strategies. And there's kind of this um, disconnect between program teachings and classroom practices. And I think Michael in his section will talk more about this on shared meaning making, um, where the student teacher is kind of the middleman and there's not enough communication between the mentor teacher and the supervisor. And this last quote kind of, um, in this case, the mentor teacher may have felt like they were being observed and that their teaching strategies were being scrutinized. Um, so I just wanna add in that what worked in my placement um, kind of was when my supervisor saw missed opportunities. Um, it was all about how can we support that and how can the university and the mentor teacher like support you when we notice that um, there are missed opportunities in your lessons or when being observed and grading ourselves. So we, um, we never, we talk about how we can change and our goals for the next observation. Um, helped it become more constructive and less evaluative. So if anyone else would like to add um, about shared positionality. Yeah, Mallory, I think I liked what you talked about with after the observation. And I even think that during the observation, positionality is really important. I worked with Evelyn for the second placement and another supervisor for the first placement. And something that they both did that I really liked was they walked around the room while I was teaching. They were kind of a part of the class. They, especially at the beginning would, of the year, would help out a little bit with management if something flared up near them. And my mentor teacher, Eve, did the same thing. So it really felt like I was part of a team when I was teaching. I was definitely taking the lead, but I definitely had support. And that kind of encouraged me to try new things when I was being observed rather than just present or recreate lessons I had already done or that I already felt really comfortable with. Yeah, for sure. It can kind of feel like just a show that you're putting on and it having that, um, having your mentor, teacher and supervisor kind of with you in the room, supporting you as you're doing observation is um, so helpful. And in that first quote where um, this student teacher felt penalized for making mistakes, it's really a collaborative process really between all of us. We tell our students it's okay to make mistakes and we learn from them. And so that same positionality should be included with you as well. Yeah, I think too, just going along with that, um, evaluating myself was really hard, but I felt like when I was able to get that feedback from my mentor teacher and my supervisor, I kind of was able to be like, oh, okay, like take a step back, like look at what you have done, like look at what's been happening with the students and they they have been impacted in some way. But I mean, we're, we judge ourselves very hard as trying to like be the best that we can be and especially new within this profession. But just having that support from my mentor teacher and supervisor at the same time. And even just in the same room talking about it made me feel like, okay, I, I guess I could put myself higher. Well, and just when you guys are talking about having, you know, the, it'd be a triad, a three equal partnership. I, I worked with a lot of supervisors and one of the ones that I worked with actually started off the um, placement by observing me with the master teacher or with the student teacher and watched me teach and pointed out what I was doing and even could provide you know missed opportunities that I had made and it kind of leveled that playing field for the student teacher a little bit to say okay you know even I've been doing it a long time but I'm I don't present perfectly every time and I think letting them hear like somebody pointing things out as I was doing it was was really helpful and I don't mind the feedback myself so I think you know we have to make it more even yeah, and I and I think um, a lot of times when we come into these positions as supervisors, there's that title or there's that prestige from you know for being part of the university, um, and I and I and I always have to remind the student teachers and especially the student teachers that in a 
less than a year, you will be my calling. Um, so like we are all really professionals in development. And as, uh, as somebody who has been teaching for 20 plus years, and I'm sure even Wendy, you feel the same way that in this professional development space, we are never done growing. And so we're always, we're always thinking and collaborating and, and discussing strategies together. And that's what that supervision should be like, that we're constantly coming together to think about, about dilemmas of practice and how we can support one another to you know, develop our own professional growth. Should we move on to the next one? Okay, so our second goal was shared inquiry. And our definition of shared inquiry is where participants are able to explore together in a discussion on the topic. They're able to collaborate with each other. And in this case, we mean the discussion between mentor teacher, student teacher, and supervisor. Um, it will help the student teacher understand their strengths and things to improve on, like as I talked about before, when all counterparts are contributing, they just feel more supported and they feel like they're getting more feedback and it's just enlightening for all counterparts at that point, as Wendy had mentioned as well, with the effective communication where the university feels more tied into the field work than it should, than it might not feel as, at the moment, but there, um, these are some questions that we asked in our MAT program to our student teachers. Um, and on the next slide, you can see the quotes from them. I have a, quite a few here, but I just kind of wanted to show the disparity between it. The first quote, it really shows a constraint. It talks about, well, how can they interact? Because I mean, they got to teach, right? It's hard to get that time together with the supervisor and mentor teacher. But if you look at the next um, four quotes, it really shows that it's very, very effective. So you can see that this experiences are good. So after reading quote two, you can kind of see that they're talking about bouncing the ideas off of each other. It just really calls for good collaboration and it affected the student teacher in such a way where they just felt empowered. And quote three just talks about the collaboration, wishing that there was more of that. And that's what I have underlined, that they wish there was more collaboration outside of meetings. So they found it was very helpful and it was nice. They felt supported. Quote four, it talks about when they did share, but then you can see in the underline, the joint meetings we did have. It kind of is showing you that there's not enough that they want, but, and they actually really need for that support. And then quote five shows both the supervisor and mentor teacher were helpful to me separately. So that's a problem that I, like a constant trend that I saw as I was looking through these questions specifically, that a lot of them talked about their mentor teacher and supervisor in separate. And it was like, well, yeah, they're nice and they're nice, but it's like, it was never all together a conversation that sounded like that it was collaborating and they felt empowered all together. And these are just a few students who voiced that they did have a good interaction between the three, but it actually didn't have, happen as often as they would have liked because most of the students did say that at the end of the year meeting is the only time they had a collaboration with all three. Um, but they found that the most successful and they wish it would have happened more. It was at the very end. How can they reflect any more on their teaching when the school year is over? So most students just found it very successful to talk between the, the three. Um, and they just shared their inquiry, sharing their inquiry. They just felt was very valuable, especially for a student teacher growing as an educator. And even I feel like on every counterpart for a supervisor growing as a supervisor or a mentor teacher growing as a mentor as well. Um, so now I want to kind of throw out these questions to my fellow panelists. So what do you feel is effective and what do you feel can be improved on? And we actually have a paired placement here. So how do you think a paired placement as well will impact inquiry? I think it depends on how the master teacher and structures a paired placement. I think that um, sometimes it's hard like for ownership as you're a student teacher and trying to lead lessons like the students might be looking and just trying to say, who am I supposed to be working with? And I feel kind of going back to the question earlier of, I think it's the communication and the relationship building between the three of us um, that is really key, especially in that first placement. Um, because we don't know each other yet. 
right? And so I really feel that the communication and the time to get to know each other is really crucial um, for that collaborative work to happen throughout the year. So that would be my piece for that part. One thing that I do know that worked also, sorry to jump in again, um, at our school is we had three different student teachers at our school. And so having um, one supervisor there, it really did allow for um, us to really look at our schedules to see when it might fit so that we could meet either before or after the lesson with the supervisor and the student teacher just to check in, see how things were going, and also to talk about the lesson itself. Um, so I feel like that might be something to consider as student teachers are being placed. Yeah, I think, sorry, go ahead, Wendy. I was just gonna say, be a little flexible in your timing too. Cause I know there were several days that Evelyn was, we had three, four student teachers at one time on my campus and she was there all day. So we took her to lunch one day and it was such a different feeling and really, you know, just not talking about lessons, just talking about the career of teaching and the, you know, it was just, it was a different type of connection. And it's true that, you know, most of the time, especially like I had the two girls, so one would teach, they'd hurry out and debrief and then the other would teach and then I would take over. And sometimes it was challenging, but you can, you can be creative. It doesn't have to, have to happen right then and there. It could be an hour later, two hours later, or have lunch, you just never know mm -hmm. where you fit it in. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I mean, this all really speaks to the importance of building relationships and building relationships takes time and effort. It doesn't just happen overnight. And so um, Wendy and Eve, they were both very willing to carve out space, their recess, their lunch, whatever it was, to have that three-way conversation with us. And there was a lot of opportunities because I did have three at, at, the, um, at Irvine and then also three in Santa Ana, actually four in Santa Ana. So I could, I could spend the whole day there. So like at any time somebody had a break, we're like, let's meet, let's meet. And so that, that has to be very intentional. Otherwise it's, you know, we're just bogged down with one observation and the next observation and the next observation is like a drive-by observation. And you don't really create that kind of relationship when it's all just, I gotta go in, but I gotta go to the next one. So, um, I mean, there are things structurally that needs to be created within that space for us to build that kind of relationship. Yeah, and another thing, Evelyn, that even I always, commented about that we appreciated from you was even though sometimes we weren't able to have that three-way inquiry conversation, you were always very fast to provide feedback and to provide really specific feedback on lesson plans that you were really a part of the process, even if that wasn't a time where we were able to meet with you physically. So I think that that was, is another tip that I would give for supervisors. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of feedback, but when you can give a little bit of feedback quickly on a lesson plan, that really includes you as part of the process of inquiry in that classroom. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to the next one in the interest of time. So the last one that we had was shared meaning making, and this kind of connects the two that we just talked about, right? Once you've established that positionality that as a supervisor, the supervisor is not necessarily coming in purely for evaluation, but is also gonna be part of the class. Um, and be part of co-teaching a little bit. And once you've established some time for inquiry for the mentor teacher and the student teacher and the supervisor to work together, what are they gonna work together about? How are they gonna make meaning? And in the spirit of the conference, some of the ideas that we had were um, about diversity, equity, justice, inclusion. Um, at UCI this year, we spent a lot of time focused on talk moves and student discourse, especially after 18 months for many students away from the physical classroom. And we also spent a lot of time talking about universal design. So that was something that Evelyn helped us with when it came to our, uh, our inquiry and our meaning making. So if you go to the next one, I pulled a couple of quotes and uh, Leanne and Mallory helped me. Um, and similar to what uh, Leanne was talking about, a lot of students really appreciate when all three can meet together but it only happened for a lot of UCI students in what we call the IDP, which is the end of 
uh, placement conference. Um, so those first two quotes both talk about that. And then the third quote at the bottom there really gives a great example of meaning making, how the supervisor really feels like she's or he is part of the classroom and is pointing out both what the mentor teacher is doing and what the student teacher is doing to make the classroom a great environment for learning. So one specific example I would give, and then I'll open it up to my uh, fellow panelists, um, was at our school, Evelyn really encouraged us for meaning making in terms of developing real authentic relationships with our students and their families and attending community events. Um, I know one day we had a meeting with Evelyn and we were almost finished, but she let us end the meeting a little bit early so that even I could go see a couple of innings of a couple of our students playing in a baseball game. And stuff like that really makes you part of the community as an educator. And that was just a really, great lesson that I got that day because the families were so excited to see us there and it's definitely something that I want to incorporate into my practice. So that was one way that Evelyn helped me make meaning in the community that I was in. Do any of the other panelists have meaning making experiences that they want to share? In my first placement, I found it very impactful. I was fortunate where I didn't have um, um, UCI, I had to go to UCI to school at night and everything like that. So I was able to join parent conferences and my mentor teacher was really allowing me to collaborate with the parents and like talk to them. It wasn't just her talking to the parents, it was me and her talking to the parents. And it just really impacted them as well. And when I would um, take them to the gate, because I was in kindergarten at the time, when I would take them to the gate, they would be like, oh, hi, like, you know, and they, they knew who I was. And I just felt like I was able to make an impact um, on them. And the kids would always, you know, they always say who their like role model is. So they would always talk about me or talk about my mentor teacher. And it was just like really nice to feel um, included in that way. And I just felt like I was able to make meaning within the community and things like that. And what about meaning making, Mallory, you can go with either or meaning making as far as bringing university practices to the classroom, because I think a lot of times it's hard to bridge that gap. So either way you want to take it. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to mention. I was going to say that I think an obstacle to shared meaning making within this um, partnership is when there is that disconnect between university practices and what's happening in the classroom. And I'm just really glad that um, Evelyn and Wendy, they were able to communicate about ways to support me despite these differences. And it helped me going into observations, knowing that my mentor, teacher, and supervisor were aware that it's not possible for me to satisfy all the university expectations and completely follow my mentor teacher's guidance at the same exact time in one lesson. So I guess just having them communicate about those differences um, apart from me so that it's not um, so much as of a stressor on student teachers to play that role of the middleman, um, I think can lend itself to um, shared meaning making. Yeah. Um, and as we all know, everyone here in the audience can probably relate to this, but there are often things that uh, are theory and there are things that are uh, more practical in the field. And this role of the supervisor is a little bit tricky, you know, because we have things that we want the students to be able to demonstrate uh, from their methods courses into their classroom teaching. And yet sometimes in the classroom, that's just not doable. And so as the supervisor, um, that co-constructed knowledge, like how do we make this work is really, really important. And again, I have to give credit to even to Wendy for giving the students that space to be able to say, okay, you know what, we can tweak it, we can try this, um, but let's talk about what works and what doesn't work um, so that it's not just, you know, an imposition of knowledge onto the school site, um, but also just but also you know, to be able to say we are co-constructing knowledge together. And that is, you know, that's something that I really appreciate about the partnerships that I've developed with Wendy and Eve and you know, with the student teachers here. And we agree, Evelyn, you've been amazing. Thank you. So speaking of co-constructing, right, we're gonna take a little bit of time in breakout rooms to hear from all of you about steps we can take to kind of work towards this uh, more inclusive uh, environment and partnership. 
So if you go to the next slide, Evelyn, um, we're going to be in three different breakout rooms. You'll each be with um, two of us, um, one student teacher and one either mentor or uh, supervisor. And just I've been in a lot of breakout rooms recently at UCI, and it, sometimes it's really hard, like nobody really knows what to say. So we have a couple questions and a couple handouts that you can kind of peruse to be thinking. Um, it's always good for personal reflection. So maybe thinking about a positive experience you've had working with a student teacher and a mentor teacher and what made that relationship particularly successful. Or sometimes non-examples are instructive also. So thinking about a less positive experience you had and what would have made that relationship more successful. And then um, we have the three goals listed down here as well. I believe you all have access to the slide deck um, if you wanna look back at it. And then on the next page, on the next slide, Evelyn, we just have a couple of um, handouts that kind of have some of our ideas. Um, Leanne and Mallory did a great job putting together that second one, tips on paired placements, which I think is something that's becoming a little bit more common. So if you haven't seen it yet, it might be something that's coming. And that's just where there's two student teachers placed with one mentor teacher. And then on top, we kind of tried to redraw a model of mentor teacher, student teacher, and supervisor all in a circle rather than like a hierarchy. And then we have a little chart of our three areas of focus, what we've seen in those areas and what suggestions we have. So you can look at those resources, think about your personal experiences, and we look forward to hearing from you in the breakout rooms. Okay, so we're gonna um, let you go to breakout rooms for about 10 minutes to discuss. Um, Mallory and Mallory, you and I are in the first room, right? Um, and, and then Leanne and Wendy will be in the second room and then Michael and Eve will be in the third room. We're going to be talking about the same things, but we're just going to go in different orders just so that we can cover all the shared um, shared documents or shared um, like positionality, meaning making all that in different orders um, so that when we come back to the whole group discussion, somebody will have touched upon all of the, uh, no, somebody will have touched upon the topic in a deeper way. Okay, so I just wanted to um, offer this space now to talk about things that you talked, you discussed in your breakout room sessions, and we'll start with um, the shared positionality group, which is room one. If anyone would like to share, like what you have learned or thought about, or your issues that you're now wrestling with um, based on our conversation, um, let's um, have a conversation here in this larger space. A couple of folks talked about just the awkwardness of finding that time and space to make that relationship and and to consider the student teachers practice together and what my and and there was some discussion of moves that might be made to bring supervisors and mentor teachers together in other kinds of ways so that they can talk about teaching together. Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Yeah, I mean, I definitely felt like um, some of the things that we talked about in our group was more challenges than solutions, um, because we do recognize the necessity of having this shared space where we're meeting with, we're finding time to meet with a mentor teacher, we're building relationships, and yet there isn't that opportunity. And so, um, if others of you in, in the session have ideas, uh, we'd love to hear as well. I'm just wondering how, um, what the collaboration was to begin with, with mentor teachers coming into this triad, because in my experience, my the mentor teachers are so busy, they don't really want to have me uh, ask them into a debriefing or uh, they're just very, um, uh, they want their time. They're just very busy. And especially over the last couple of years where things change all the time, they just seem um, you know, more overwhelmed than usual. And so I'm wondering how, how do you change that? How do you make the mentor teacher feel more a part of that triad? Mm. That's a really good question. I'm gonna defer to my um, colleagues, Wendy and Eve to answer that question. I'm going to go back to you make time for what's important. And I think that, um, and I mean, I, I wear a lot of hats at my school. 
you, the girls know my schedule is absolutely crazy, but um, it's important. And I think that if you make sure the master teacher knows that, I think one of the powerful things that um, both Evelyn and Laura before her that I have worked with at UCI did was they always made sure I knew I was important to that meeting. I wasn't an afterthought to that meeting. So therefore I'm gonna make time for it and being flexible in that time. So maybe, you know, I do step out while the student teachers continue. Um, you know, I understand uh, overwhelmed. I understand inundated. I, I, I hold probably five, six different roles at my school, but if the master teacher knows that they're valued and that they're a part of it right from the beginning, um, I think they'll make time for what it is. And I'll tell you that first thing, and I know I already mentioned it, but when Laura would come into my room and she would ask me to teach and observe, and that immediately put me into that triad was because I was being observed too. And they were showing what I was doing and how that will help the student teacher. So, you know, we make time for what's important. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, sorry, I was going to say that I think it also goes back to that relationship building in the beginning and just trying to do everything you can to build that relationship with the um, master teachers at the schools. And we know you had a, you had your hand I was going to say, I totally have the same sentiments of the people speaking before me, but I kind of remember that saying that said something like we have to teach smarter, not harder. And I think of compressing. Uh, and so that time that I have with the teachers, I try to model some of the things that I would like to see in the way that I hold the, the little the, uh, session and uh, like I said, the reflection and then bring in those that social emotional that they need, the social justice, the everything else with that period of time. So it has to, that period of time has to be well organized is why I say sometimes I put something out first to uh, in an email to the student teachers. But I was getting ready to say if the job description doesn't change, but I what I'm hearing in this conference is a lot of uh, uh, maybe tweaking the job description or or expanding the job description then that pe that uh professional development that part that you have is all that you have to do all of these things so you have to find strategies like the reflective questioning the modeling uh uh, video snippets or whatever, all these different things to have prepared to be able to address these things in that short period of time. Edwina, I really liked what you said because I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head. To improve supervision, we have to kind of change the job description. To change um, the, our three-way relationship, we have to change the job description of the mentor teacher as well, right? So I, I love what you just said here. And, and I think our follow-up space is, what do we do? I mean, what do we need to do to change that job description? Okay, so I wanna move on to shared inquiry. Folks from that group, what do you like to share out? Uh-oh, I hate to say it, but I have something else. I I was I don't have anything to say about that group, but I heard mention of some uh, paired uh, what what do they call it paired with Placement. the student teachers, and I was hoping that that didn't extend from a shortage a number of teachers because I'm thinking about how overwhelmed the uh, mentor teacher or the cooperating teacher is, and now they would have two I guess. Uh, student teachers as well. So this is a critical question. I don't have any comment on it, but I can see that it's very, very important. Well, Edwina, to piggyback on what you said um, in our group, that was something we were talking about is um, uh, if you if you have that model, then you can have that triad conversation as the um, you know, cooperating teacher number, uh, sorry, uh, teacher candidate number two is uh, alone with the class, the three of you can pull out and, and have that deep conversation and the um, shared experience. So um, it would solve the problem of, of, of mentor teacher shortage and of having the time to, to meet all together. 
Another thing that came up in our group from, I think it was Barbara, she works in Fullerton and they tweaked the name. Can you, can you explain that Barbara, how the name change made a difference? So we for years have been called supervisors and about four or five years ago, we shifted our name to clinical coaches, mm -hmm. put the emphasis on coaching our teacher candidates through their student teaching process and, um, and support and it, it's more of a light of a, a supportive role versus an evaluative, even though we still evaluate them, but it, it really just shifted everybody's perspective. And then also at Cal State Fullerton, which I didn't say in our little group, is we do a co-teaching, co-planning model, and that's what's um, modeled for the teacher candidates in their methods classes. And when we're looking for our mentor teachers, um, we're very clear that that's the model we're looking to see put in the classroom when the student uh, teacher candidate is placed in the classroom. And there's like a little module that the mentor teachers um, complete just one time that talks all about the co-teaching, uh, co-planning strategies that um, we'd like to emphasize with our teacher candidates. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Okay, I'm gonna move on to shared meaning makings and anyone from that group would like to share? I mean, I'll say one great idea that I heard in our group came from Scott and he was talking about kind of using his initial meeting with the student teacher and the mentor teacher to really set expectations for the work that they were going to do. And he was saying that if those expectations are really clear that this is going to be a collaborative process at the beginning, that he's found most of his mentor teachers that he works with are able to get on board. So I don't know if you wanted to say more about that, Scott. The challenge is partially scheduling. But if I have a day, I don't like to have any more than one student teacher a day. If I have a day that I can devote to that student teacher and to that cooperative teacher so that after the lesson, we can all meet. And I've had people give up lunches and we all have lunch together. Uh, I've had people recess is a little quick after school. If we have to, we Zoom. If we can get that done and if I make it clear to them that I think it's really important that we work together as a team, I've seen a lot of fruit. Really good things happen. Right. I think that's a good segue into um, the next portion. I'm going to just fast forward through this. So it's the call to action. There are a lot of supervisors here. And um, just based on the student survey data and also the conversations that the six of us had together, there are a few things that came themes. I should, let me clarify, like themes that came out of um, the conversations and the surveys that we had. Um, so the three that really resonated were the, was the, were the importance of one, engaging in teamwork together in an authentic manner, being present, and then developing an equity lens. And by developing an equity lens, I don't mean developing an equity, no, developing students' equity lens and working with students, but us as supervisors, how do we develop an equity lens as we work with our student teachers. So engaging in teamwork. I pulled some quotes from um, student teachers and I love this quote. She said, I loved having my supervisor come. It always felt like my team was there. And what this quote speaks to me of is um, how our students really value um, having someone in their corner, being their cheerleader to support them and guide them through the student teaching process. So several of you have said this already, tips for supervisors, assume the role of the coach. And I really liked um, what one of the audience said from, from Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton, um, who changed the name of supervisor to the instructional coach. Because, you know, as a coach, we're not there with a clipboard and paper and a pencil to check off whether or not they completed their TPEs and whether or not they are now skilled and really how do you become skilled in one year? And now after 20 years of teaching, I can't call myself skilled. And so assuming that role of the coach, like analyze the problems together, analyze student work together, um, and then come up with strategies to improve the teaching practice together. Two, engage in teacher inquiry together. I think this is really, really key. There are so many challenges in the classroom and after so many years of teaching, there are always gonna be challenges. And so, we need to be there with them as professional colleagues to identify dilemmas of practice, to design the intervention and the strategies, to look at student sample work and to say, why don't we try this? See how that works and the next time we come back and we'll talk about that again. It's the iterative cycle of just 
coming to question and wrestle and implement, you know, the whole PLC model. And we need to be part of that PLC model. Um, value the knowledge that each person brings to this process. You know, some of us have stronger theoretical knowledge. Others of us have stronger pedagogical knowledge. And nobody knows the students better than the mentor teachers and the student teachers. And that knowledge is really important as well. So valuing the collective knowledge um, that we all bring to the table to help support our student teachers as they work with the students in the classroom. And then it, of course, communicate, communicate, communicate. I cannot emphasize that enough. The more that you communicate, the better that we are in sync with how we can support our candidates. So two, being present. Um, Debbie was a mentor teacher that I worked with in the past, and she said, I appreciate that you spend the whole day at the school getting to know our students or getting to know our school and our students. Um, and I've said this before um, earlier in the presentation, it makes a whole lot of difference when you're able to make yourself be there at the, at the school site, because then you're now part of the school community. You get to see the bell system, you get to see the lunch, you get to see the policies, you get to see the students, you get to see the families. Um, and the mentor teachers appreciate the fact that you are there anytime they can grab you if they wanna to talk to you. Um, but again, this is not a model that's not always doable because um, if we're scheduled at different sites, it makes it really difficult for us to stick around at one place. We have to you know, get in our car, drive to the next place, get in the car, drive to the next place. But those are institutional things that we need to rethink in terms of how do we support the work of supervisors. So tips for supervisors, being flexible with your scheduling. Um, I always come with the approach that the student's time are more important than mine and the mentor teacher's time is more important than mine. It really stinks to have to do a math lesson at 2 p.m. because they have to work around your schedule, right? That's just a disaster in the making. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work for your student teachers, not gonna work for, your student, for their students. So being flexible with your scheduling to make sure that you are meeting them when they are at their best uh, is, is kind of my model. And then being flexible with the university protocol. We have so many protocols, right? Supervisors, we have to do so many things. We have to check off so many things. We have to submit so many paperwork. And just that flexibility in terms of, okay, I here's where you are. And I wanna make sure that I am supporting you where you are as well, in terms of methodology, in terms, in terms of pedagogy, whatever it is, this should be co-constructed together. Right. Um, and then work with the students in the class, get to know them, know them by name, um, be someone else in the classroom that they can ask questions. And, you know, when you had, when you start getting hugs and, and, the, and they're starting to ask you about how to do the work, then you know you got plugged in into the classroom environment. And then, as I mentioned before, stick around. It makes a huge, huge difference. And, and again, I want to give a shout out to my Santa Cruz colleagues who are here, um, watch their videos. If you didn't attend their sessions, watch their videos on how they engage their student teachers in collaborative inquiry around a problem of practice and how uh, other candidates are supporting each other and, and taking a deeper dive about the questions and challenging them and supporting them. It's fantastic to see student teachers coming together to wrestle with professional questions. And then lastly, developing an equity lens. Um, Laura, as Wendy had mentioned previously, um, she was a UCS supervisor. She now works uh, at Sonoma, Sonoma State. This quote never left me. She, she said, I know that every time I come in for an observation, I am an automatic trigger for some candidates. I need to provide as much SEL support to them as I expect them to give to their students. Um, I never saw myself of a as a trigger until she mentioned this. And after hearing from her, I started to think and really looking deeply at how I just by virtue of my position, by virtue of my title as supervisor, by virtue of me coming in to type up notes, I am an automatic trigger for my student teachers and then potentially to the students in the classroom because a lot of times the student teachers will say, uh, my supervisor is coming, so be on your best behavior. <laughs> so automatically, that's a trigger for them. And then, as you saw in one of the earlier quotes, 
the mentor teacher became micromanaging. So I could also be a trigger for the mentor teacher. So to disrupt all of that, I need to be very conscious of how to provide an equity lens for my student teachers. Um, be culturally responsive. Just as we expect our student teachers to be culturally responsive to their students, we also need to be culturally responsive to the student teachers. Not everybody has the same educational experience. Not everybody has the same cultural background. We need to know, um, we need to use all of that as assets in order to support them and build that into the learning process. To provide scaffolds um, to support mentor student teachers based on need. And again, now they come in at different places in their student teaching and, um, or their teaching experience. And wherever they are, we meet them where they are. And we provide scaffolds to support them where they are. Right? And three, assess the degree of agency. And I mentioned this in the earlier session, how much agency do the student teachers really have? And if they don't have the agency, it is our job as supervisors to help them break down the obstacles to provide them the agency to be able to make changes in the classroom. Um, attend to the student's social emotional well-being. This is so, 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 so important. And especially when student teachers are overwhelmed with the coursework and also full-time teaching, it is really difficult to balance everything together. And every year I have students who have, um, who experience anxiety, uh, anxiety episodes or depression or um, whose ADHD makes it really difficult for them to juggle everything, we need to be their healing space so that we can help them find that joy and passion in teaching. And then lastly, assume the role of local apprentice. This I think about a lot now that my kids are one step, well, one foot out of the door, they're heading into college and they're becoming grown. And I you know our candidates are about what 20 something years old most of the time. And they, if we can assume the role of local parentis, how much, to what extent would, you, would we go through in order to talk with them, to support them, to love on them, to advocate for them? Um, because I think that would be boundless. No, your support would be limitless. And then finally, tips for the TEP leadership, for those of you who are in director roles or coordinator roles and who actually have a voice in changing the job description, offer paid PD training. I know this is hard to do. The money is always uh, tight, but um, it, for us to be able to develop an equity lens or, or healing center practices, we need to be given opportunities to develop our professionalism and and it's, you know, it, it would be really difficult to um, ask people to do things for free, to provide opportunities for collaborative spaces. Like this conference has been so invaluable, just hearing from other supervisors and to share ideas. We need to have more of that at our school site, match supervisors with the same MTs over time, because as we develop the relationships, we are better able to negotiate, like what are some of the things that we want to do collectively together? Four, remove barriers that lessen the effectiveness of supervision, the mountains of paperwork, the long commutes, the lower low pay, let's be real, right? Um, and then also the structural university hierarchy where we are you know, not often not the third wheel, but the fifth wheel and the seventh wheel, um, our voices are not really heard. And so number five, advocate for the professionalization of supervisors, like bring us, into make us an integral part of the teacher education program. So sorry for like speeding through all of this. And I just wanna end with any questions or final, final questions and answer or final questions um, that you may have or comments. I have a question, Evelyn, about your leadership and support from the program. Did you have like, how did this whole shift to these triads happen? Was it sort of from the ground up or just curious to know how that worked? Um, well, okay, so I am kind of, uh, I, I experiment with things on my own and I am fortunate to have um, leadership who support me in trying things on my own. 
And so, you know, when I do things with um, like Mallory and Michael and the, the mentor teachers here, it's mainly because I am willing to give, put in the time and I'm willing to put in the effort to go above and beyond my role and my job description as a supervisor. But I also know that that's not something that everyone can do and is willing to do. And so the institutional constraints are so many, right? And I think that's the issue that we're running into as we talk about these kinds of reimagined spaces. What can we do? What, how can we improve our practices? It's the institutional constraints that really need to be talked about more. Um, so these are things that we will continue to have conversations around, but by no means are we there. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. These Edwina? examples make us feel like we can see what's possible and hopefully the institutions now can see that it's possible and we can take these things up. Yeah, I saw Edwina too, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, is the network working on, uh, or one some part of the network working on uh, trying to move forward on maybe the position title change of the supervisor and the lesson protocol and expanding and adapt, uh, uh, adapting or expanding the position and all of those types of things, you know, at least amongst uh, uh, universities, institutions or or with the CTC or whatever, is there something that is that uh, that you guys are thinking about, uh, or someone there's a department or something? I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think it's really important to start addressing some of those issues. I know CTC is aware of this work; they're really supportive. Um, Tina Sloan, who's the PI on the CTERN grant, is also um, on the commission or teacher credentialing and this idea of you know the field work for our student teachers is such an important space and yet we're not giving it you know we don't recognize necessarily and professionalize the role of supervisors so if there's a way that we can um you know i think when you when you take the post-conference survey it would be great to get your ideas about a uh, an or professional organization for supervisors, because as we organize, we have more of a voice. So I encourage that and hopefully you'll um, express interest in, you know, being a part of a, a statewide organization at least, so. And what's neat about our profession is when you empower teachers, mentor teachers, student teachers, you can impact thousands of lives. You're right. Mm -hmm. Pretty fulfilling thing to be involved in, isn't it? I kind of like to put that back on the supervisors too, because I almost quit last year. I had a very difficult student teacher relationship. And if it honestly was not for the university uh, program specialist, as well as the supervisor, I was able to, that supervisor, you talk about the SEL for the student teachers, that supervisor was there for me to keep me as a master teacher because I was done. I didn't think I could do it anymore with what had gone on. And so you guys play a big role for us too, just knowing that there's somebody when things go wrong in this relationship that we can reach out to for assistance. If, if I can attach to that, I appreciate you saying that because I did put in the chat this idea of what, what, do, what do mentor teachers get out of this relationship? And I always worry that we rely too much on the martyrdom of teachers the idea that teachers will always do things for other people and that the university is going to ask and teachers will step up because they step up to everything. But it'd be nice to be organized around what are the good things a university can offer a mentor teacher in terms of in increased knowledge, skills, partnerships with what the university is doing. I work with the California math project, so I invite my mentor teacher peers to be a part of that too. Just the idea of what does the university offer back instead of assuming, because you all have so much burden already, and I'm always, always, always grateful, but I also realize that it's a big ask every time I, I work with this, when I reach out to a mentor teacher, I know it's a big ask, and I have to understand that. Mm -hmm.